All right, we will go ahead and get started here. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our complex pediatrics echo session today. Really big group today. Thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm Troy Jorgensen. I'm the program manager for Project Echo Nevada. If you're unfamiliar with ECHO, we are a telehealth program, uh, part of the telemedicine pie is what we say. So it, uh, Project ECHO originated at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in the early 2000s, and we adopted it here at the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine in 2012. And uh, what we do is we put together teams of subject matter experts, whether that be um, like we have today, Dr. Eckert, pediatric endocrinologist, and Dr. Amy Hughes-Lansing, uh, child and adolescent health psychologists, or we have cardiologists, we've got infectious disease specialists, um, and we hold these video conference sessions as you're on right now, uh, and connect those specialists with you, all, all of you across the state, um, providing patient care in your various communities and locations. Uh, really, uh, the goal is connecting you directly with specialists. So your patients don't have to be referred to a specialist. You can just sign on to an echo clinic, present that patient to somebody, and they can give you feedback and recommendations of things that you can, that you can implement yourself right there locally with your patient, rather than having them have to be referred, maybe wait a long time to see that, to see that specialist. Um, so yeah, really that's our goal, is just connecting all of the great resources that we have across Nevada. Um, so there's a big group today. Typically, we would go around and have everybody introduce themselves, but with so many of you joining, I think that would take a long time. So if you can actually write in through the chat box, and I'll send something out through the uh, chat right now, just so you see that pop up. It'll pop up as a little orange icon. So if you can please write in your name, uh, your credential, and your location for our records, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, but we'll go around and we'll start off uh, and have our hub team members for the day uh, introduce themselves. So Dr. Eckert, do you want to go ahead? Hey everybody, I'm Kathy Eckert. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and uh, heading up the Complex Pediatric Project ECHO program. Thanks Dr. Eckert. And Dr. Lansing? Hi, I'm Amy Lansing. I am a pediatric psychologist and a professor at uh, the University in the Par Department of Psychology and my work focuses on uh, kids who have chronic diseases and how to help support management. Thanks, Dr. Lansing. And our guest speaker for the day, Dr. Jonathan Steidel. Hi, everyone. I'm John Steidel. I'm a dermatologist and Mohs surgeon. I work at the Skin Cancer and Dermatology Institute here in Reno, Nevada. Um, so mostly I do surgery, but still have quite a bit of knowledge about uh, general dermatology cases as well. Thanks, Dr. Steidel. And then our other ECHO staff member for the day, Sneha. Hi, I'm Sneha Sharma. I'm the program coordinator for Project ECHO Nevada. Thanks, Neha. All right, and right now I'll turn it over to um, our partners for the session today, the Nevada Cancer Coalition. Uh, Christine, do you want to give us some information about the Cancer Coalition? Um, just a second. Uh, oh, did we lose her? Um, okay, it looks like maybe we lost lost Christine. Cassie, would you be able to? Um... <laughs> I can try. I'm not even, I haven't even been here a whole month yet, but we can see what slides you have. All right. Um, yeah, so Nevada Cancer Coalition, we're, um, we're a nonprofit and we try to reduce the cancer burden in Nevada. And these are some of the ways that we do that. So uh, cancer prevention and early detection. I'm actually the new early detection programs manager. Um, but like I said, just started less than a month ago. We have survivorship, education, and advocacy. Um, yeah, so we, we work with the state. We also work at the local level. Um, we run off grants through the CDC that the state hands out to us. And these are just some of the partners and members that we work with. And then this is Christine's big program, uh, the SunSmart Nevada. So um, she was able to go around and get sunscreen dispensers in school, work on policies at the state level for schools to allow children to use sunscreen and other, implement other prevention programs in the schools. 
And it looks like she has some links on there if you want to learn more about it. It's a really great program that's made really big strides in the last couple of years. Thanks, Cassie. Christine, I think I just found you. I'll unmute you. Could you uh, okay. share a little bit more if you'd like? Christine, are you there? Okay, maybe we, maybe we lost her again. All right, no problem. Thank you so much, Cassie, for, for sharing a little bit about the Nevada Cancer Coalition. Uh, so like I said, ECHO, our goal is really um, providing uh, action and access to um, medical specialists that we have here through the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine. So we've got uh, Dr. S Dr. Stile, uh, Dr. Hughes Lansing, and uh, Dr. Eckert. If you want to run run a case by us, we'd be happy to hear that. So does anybody have something that they want to run by our, our panel today? Please feel free to unmute yourselves with a little microphone icon in the lower left corner of the Zoom window, and we'd be happy to hear that from you. So anything we can support you with today. I know it's a pretty big group today, so it might be intimidating, but like, yeah, we're, we're just here to support you. It's a, um, you know, friendly environment. Nobody's going to judge you. Um, so any, any cases that you've got questions about that we can help you with. All right. Seeing no takers, I think we'll get going then. Uh, Dr. Stato, I'll pull up your, your slides and uh, we will get going today. Okay. Can everybody see those? Okay. All righty, take it away. Okay, so uh, hello again, everyone. Um, I had done this presentation for I'm trying to think. Uh, it was the, the Cancer Coalition, Nevada Cancer Coalition, a couple of years ago. And it's the same presentation. I don't know if any of you had attended that at, at that point, but it's quite an exhaustive uh, PowerPoint presentation. So just for the purpose of time and also to just allow for everybody to interact with me, if you guys have any questions at all as I'm going through this presentation, please feel free to you know stop me. And we can certainly, if there's specific cases that you guys want to talk about, if you had specific questions about any of the the topics that we're going to discuss, uh, please, by all means, you know, stop me and we can talk about it. Most of this, of course, hopefully you guys all have access to this PowerPoint presentation. So um, if there's anything that, that uh, you know, we skip over, it's mainly just for the purpose of time and just to try to be, you know, efficient. So mainly I'm going to focus on, um, you know, common skin conditions in the, the elementary and childhood populations. Uh, if we get to uh, malignancies and skin cancers, great. If not, um, you know, that's not the primary focus, even though it says that on the title. I think most of it is just we're going to try to focus on just the common skin conditions. So mainly what we're going to do is, again, focus on the, the skin conditions. Um, we can talk about common types of skin cancer and the more modern, uh, more well-known treatments. Uh, the interactive quiz we probably won't get to just, uh, just for the purpose of time. So these are some of the, the main um, sort of conditions that we'll try to focus on today, of course. Common things being eczema, acne, um, you know, sunburns, what's going on when you get a sunburn, uh, viral rashes, uh, of course, ringworm infections, warts, and other types of common infections and infestations. So the first topic, we're, you know, most commonly what we see, uh, particularly in our office is you see a lot of eczema, especially in Reno, Nevada, where the, the climate's very, very arid and dry. Uh, you tend to see a lot more cases in more arid climates. But most of this atopic dermatitis, you, hopefully you guys can see the photos uh, pretty well. Uh, in terms of how it presents, uh, usually we would describe these lesions as, you know, erythematous, scaly patches or thin plaques. Um, and actually the location that, that kids get these, these rashes, uh, when they get eczema, it's sort of dependent on the age. So I, I tried to kind of set it up in terms of 
where you would see the rashes, where you would see eczema, depending on the age of the child. So in infants uh, and toddlers, usually kids less than two years of, of age, they tend to get it on their extensor surfaces. So face is a very common location, um, forearms, uh, lower legs, hands, so areas that they would be crawling around on. You can kind of see that the first uh, two or three photos, uh, starting from the left, you'll see those photos. And then of course, as you get older in childhood, you know, older than three or four, or, you know, closer into the preteen age, uh, and younger, you tend to see it more in the flexural surfaces or the areas where there's creases in the skin. So for the you know, example, behind the knees, uh, elbow creases, back of the neck, those are very common areas. And if you look at the very bottom right-hand picture, uh, this is not necessarily a true eczema picture, but it's sort of a marker and an indicator for people that may get eczema especially when you have darker skin. Uh, patients that have darker skin tend to be more sensitive to uh, sort of a secondary pigment phenomenon. We call it uh, post-inflammatory pigment change. And depending on your skin type and, and how dark your skin is, uh, some patients get lighter, their skin gets lighter as, a, as sort of a secondary phenomenon from that inflammation that's going on. And that, that specific picture there that's a, that's a very good example of something called pityriasis alba. Uh, so it's not a true uh, you know, eczema per se, it's more of a secondary phenomenon that we see in kids who get eczema. And you can see it, of course, a little bit more exaggerated in kids who have darker skin. Uh, so you know, very common treatments, the, the sort of mainstay of treatment for atopic dermatitis and eczema is to try to reestablish a barrier. Uh, part of the problem with atopic dermatitis is that it's not necessarily just a dry skin condition. Um, it's a true sort of molecular phenomenon or molecular anomaly where there are specific proteins in the skin that establish a natural biological barrier that, that holds moisture and water in, in your skin, in your body. Um, and kids who have atopic dermatitis or eczema, it's the, the proteins that are supposed to make up the barrier are either lacking or they're dysfunctional. And so um, when you have this condition, you're constantly losing moisture and losing water from your skin, which causes you to get dry. And then the longer that this process goes on, that's when the inflammation and the redness and the itching starts. Uh, so the biggest, biggest sort of uh, the main uh, sort of approach to treating this is to try to reestablish that barrier and the best way that we know how is to to try to moisturize the skin. Um, when I talk to my patients, I usually will, will say that when you're thinking about moisturizers, you want to think about something that is going to, to have a, a thicker barrier. So of course, ointments, uh, things like Vaseline or petroleum jelly or Aquaphor, those are your ointments. Those tend to be much better for not only moisturizing the skin, but also sort of reestablishing that barrier to protect the skin and hold the moisture in the skin. Um, that's the mainstay of, of sort of preventative and just general maintenance therapy for eczema. Of course, when you get eczema, there's always going to be a waxing and waning uh, sort of characteristic to the, to the condition. You could be doing everything right. You can tell the parents they could be doing everything right in terms of making sure that the skin is really well hydrated, that they're not using you know, harsh soaps or detergent soaps, um, and they can still get flares. It's just sort of, that's just the, 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 the type of condition that it is. That's just the way it is. It's the behavior of the condition. So of course, when, when kids get flares, we have to try to minimize the inflammation that's going on, and that's where the topical steroids come in. Um, Depending on the age class, I tend to start, of course, with younger kids. You want to use a much weaker topical steroid, something like hydrocortisone, like a two and a half percent strength. And then, of course, in, in older patients, you know, maybe six, seven, eight years of age up to preteens, you can use something a little bit stronger. But the whole point is to use those medications to try to calm and bring that inflammation down so that the itching is well controlled and they can get back into more of a maintenance routine. Um, and then, of course, in terms of vehicles, what I mean by vehicles is basically the formulation of the topical medication. Um, so, of course, ointments would be a vehicle that's sort of a, a much better vehicle because it drives the medication into the skin a little bit more effectively, and then followed by creams, 
and then lotions. I almost never recommend using lotions just because it doesn't have enough uh, sort of moisture. Lotions don't hold enough moisture in them. It's mainly just powder with water. So when you put a lotion on the skin, you're essentially just basically, uh, it's a very light layer of moisturizer and a lot of the water content ends up actually evaporating up off the skin. So you wanna really encourage the, the parents of these kids to, to use something a little thicker and, and consistency is really the biggest, biggest thing. It's really, really important that they, that they moisturize every day, you know, at least probably twice a day, just to keep that moisture on the skin to minimize the possibility of, of a reflare or, or a flare up of their eczema. Um, and as you guys can see, of course, there's other ways to sort of minimize, you know, really bad flares. Steroid wet wraps is basically where you have the patient, um, you know, take a bath or a short, short duration shower, and you don't even have to completely dry the, the child. You basically just pat them to dry, and then you put the, the steroid on, you know, pretty much their entire body, arms, legs, trunk, and then you take a, you know, sort of a, a pair of uh, long underwear, or if they're a young child, you know, one of those, those um, uh, the pajamas is sort of a one piece pajama, you put it in, you dunk it in water, you wring it out, and you put it directly on the skin, have them wear it. And then you could take a warm blanket or something and wrap them around it, and you keep it on there for at least, you know, an hour or two. And basically what that does is it occludes the skin and it forces the medication into the skin much more effectively. And it's almost, it's very synonymous to uh, in some ways giving systemic steroids um, depending on the strength of the steroid that you're using. So it's a very effective way if you're having a patient that's really, really flared and has like a total body flare, that's a really good effective treatment to, to use. It's not something we do on a regular basis. You would have them do it maybe once or twice a week at the most, uh, but it's a very effective uh, method for trying to control these really total body flares if, if a patient is having a really severe eczema flare. Um, topical antibiotics, I tend to use uh, if they're having, you know, a lot of kids have secondary infections with their eczema. And so the topical antibiotics, I think, are a lot more effective. We tend to use, you know, things like Bactroban if you're noticing areas that are um, a little bit more crusted or if they seem to have an associated impetigo with their skin. Uh, one of the other uh, sort of key factors in, in patients who have eczema is that uh, they're, they're at a higher risk for getting uh, skin infections, and it has to do, again, with that barrier dysfunction. Um, there's been a lot of studies that show when kids who, who get an eczema flare, the amount of microbes and the number of different bacterial microbes that accumulate on their skin goes up as they get a flare. So it's really, really important that they do. You definitely want them to bathe every day, but you want to make sure that they're not using harsh detergent soaps and that they're not taking too long in the shower, not using you know, water that's too, too hot, um, and, and making sure that they're still cleaning their skin, but they're, but they're not going overboard as far as you know, sort of causing the skin to break down again. Okay, next slide. Uh, we did have a question that came in that I- Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, do you recommend the use of very diluted bleach in the bath, and what is the reason for using it? Yeah, there's, that's actually kind of a controversial question. There has been, you know, at least when I was in my training, that was actually a very commonly recommended method. Um, you know, something we call it, you know, the, the dilute bleach baths where you would take either a quarter cup of bleach and put it in a half a tub of water, or if you're filling the tub all the way up, you'd use a half a cup of bleach. Uh, and the theory is that, of course, when these kids have this accumulation of bacteria on their skin, the dilute bleach baths is supposed to kind of get the, the bacteria levels on their skin back to a normal level. Um, but there's sort of newer evidence that doesn't, it shows that there's really not that much benefit to doing that. Um, and the problem with that is of course, chlorine, yes, it's a very good antibacterial agent, but it can also dry the skin out. So there's this sort of trade-off between using the dilute bleach baths and not using the dilute bleach baths. I don't think there's much of a difference really. You know, if you look at the, the more, more uh, sort of recent evidence and studies on using dilute bleach baths, they're not, uh, there's no statistically significant difference between 
uh, having the kids use a regular bath with just regular soap and water and a dilute bleach bath. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless you're noticing, you know, lots and lots of, uh, you know, crusted areas, or if you're worried about impetigo that's building up on the skin in several different locations, you could certainly consider that. But in general, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as a, as a normal um, maintenance therapy for eczema. Okay, two more questions and then we'll keep moving here. Uh, sure. what are the pros and cons of bathing daily? Yeah, so the pros are um, you're sort of trying to keep that, that bacterial buildup down, um, particularly staph. Of course, staph and strep are the most common skin infections that we see, particularly with atopic dermatitis patients. So the pros are that you're trying to minimize the buildup of those microbes on the skin and try to prevent a flare from you know, this bacteria. Again, it's a dysfunction of the barrier in the skin. So if you're, if you're not bathing every day, um, then certainly there's the risk of more and more bacteria building up and, and sort of causing a more, you know, more significant infection in the areas that are affected where, the, where there's inflammation and where there's barrier breakdown. So I think in terms of bathing every day, the pro is that you're minimizing the risk of infections on the skin. Um, the cons would be if, depending on what kind of cleaning agent you're using. Um, so the, you know, the, the bad thing about bathing is if you're using a regular soap, most soaps are detergents. That's kind of how they clean our skin. Uh, but the problem with doing that is if it's a really harsh detergent soap, then it's going to strip your body and your skin of its natural oils um, and cause more drying. So the biggest things that I try to recommend or what I talk to my patients about or, or you know, parents of patients is when you do bathe, yes, I would recommend bathing every day, but you want to use uh, you know, a more mild soap. So the standard recommendation that I give is, is an unscented dove. I wouldn't really recommend anything as far as regular soaps other than that. Um, most other soaps like your Ivory, your Irish Spring, Zest, uh, Caress, Lever 2000, Dial, all of those are really, really harsh on the skin, especially if you're using them every day. Um, so the con would just be, you know, it can potentially dry your skin out. So with the caveat being you want to use a gentle, a gentle soap, like an unscented dove. Um, if, the, if the children are still getting dried out from that, there's certainly gentle skin cleansers that don't have any de detergents in them that will still clean the skin, but not overly dry the skin out. And last question here, uh, what are your recommendations for over-the-counter ointments and soaps? Yeah, so over-the-counter ointments would be, uh, I would say the cheapest product would be like a general, like a petroleum jelly. You can get a, a pretty big, decent sized jar for probably less than $2. It's a really, really good moisturizer. And again, because it's so thick, it helps us reestablish the barrier that you need to kind of hold that moisture in. Um, if you don't want to use petroleum jelly, there's other products that are very, very similar, uh, especially nowadays. And there's a lot of uh, skincare lines that make their own version of petroleum-based moisturizers. Uh, so Aquaphor would be another, another common one. Um, Aquaphor has a little bit more water content in it than petroleum jelly. So it's not quite as thick, but still a very good moisturizer. And then of course, there's other, other uh, you know, companies like CeraVe is a, is a fairly well-known um, skincare line and they make their own um, sort of ointment based moisturizers. And of course they also make creams and stuff like that too. CeraVe and Cetaphil are the, probably the two most commonly recommended brands that I talk about. Uh, again, soaps would be Unscented Dove, and then CeraVe and Cetaphil both make their own gentle skin cleansers as well. Okay, one more question about soaps that came in. Uh, so what makes the, the harsh soap, soaps harsh? Is it the, ter the, the detergents, fragrance, or something else that makes them harsh? I think it's mainly the, the, the actual detergent effect of the soap, but certainly any soap that has a color or a fragrance to it, that can add to the irritation and drying effects on the skin. Great, good questions, everybody. We'll keep going here, thank you. Yeah, so moving on to a, you know, another very common skin condition that we see probably more so in the adolescent or pre-adolescent pre age groups is acne. 
Um, and previously, I think acne used to be thought of as, a, as more of a bacterial problem, which is, is actually not true. There is certainly a, a, a bacteria that we know, there's a, a species of bacteria that we know that sort of uh, contributes to acne, um, but mainly at the very microscopic or molecular level, it's inflammation. It's an inflammatory condition in the skin. Um, and part of why it happens in adolescent stage or why it starts in adolescent stage is of course there's hormonal changes that take place uh, whereby you have increased oil production in your skin. And because of that oil production, um, you know, your skin as it sheds, our, our skin sheds at a normal sort of regular rate about every 24 days or so. And when your skin sheds, if you have more oil production on your skin, the, sh the shedding, you know, your skin cells don't necessarily fall off. They sort of get caught in the pores and that, that sort of clogging process that takes place creates inflammation. And as the pores get more and more clogged, there's more and more inflammation that, that is created. And that's sort of the, the process by which, you know, your actual acne lesions are started. So these are some, if you guys look at the pictures, of course, there's sort of a spectrum here of, of acne, you know, starting on the left, you can see more of a, what I would call a, a comedonal acne, which is your, your sort of classic blackheads, whiteheads uh, type acne that most kids would start with, you know, when you start getting acne, this is sort of the most common presentation of acne. And then moving on to some of the other pictures, then you get more and more inflammation. So the more inflammation that takes place, the more uh, sort of redness you'll see, the deeper acne lesions you'll see, you'll start seeing, you know, instead of your blackheads, whiteheads, you'll start seeing papules and nodules and cysts, um, you know, as you move over into the, the photos, you guys can see that. And of course, because acne is an, is a, is an inflammatory condition, and that inflammation, as it goes deeper down into the skin, that's when you can start getting scarring, uh, as you can see in that, that sort of photo down towards the bottom. Um, so there's a whole, you know, host of, uh, you know, different medications that we would use based on the severity and the type of acne. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, we'll kind of go over some, some different types of treatments. Yeah. So comedonal acne, again, is probably the most common uh, early presentation of acne. And because it has to do with a poor clogging issue, uh, we tend to use topical medications. So the, the sort of gold standard for, for treating comedonal acne or your blackheads and whiteheads would be a topical wash. I, I very frequently would recommend something like benzoyl peroxide and then your topical retinoids. Those, that's sort of the gold standard. So things like Retin-A, or um, you know any other topical retinoid, and retinoids are actually basically vitamin A derivative medications. And how they work in acne, um, going back to that that sort of skin shedding problem where your skin is shedding at a certain rate and getting caught in the pores. How retinoids work is they actually speed up the rate at which your skin sheds. So one of the common you know sort of effects of those medications, of course, it can kind of dry you out a little bit as your skin and your your face or wherever the acne is, is adjusting to that medication. But the benefit of that, the long-term benefit of that is that if the skin is turning over at a little bit faster rate, there's less time for those skin cells to get caught in, in the pores. Um, and so it also helps reduce the amount of oil that's produced in the skin. Um, it can, over time, over longer periods of time, it can shrink the size of your pores. So again, much less um, you know, chance for those skin cells to get caught in the pores. Um, and then other sort of cosmetic benefits that, you know, some of our older patients actually like are, you know, can reduce the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. It can help with uh, just overall skin tone, you know, evens out your skin tone. Uh, so those are your topical medications for mild comedonal acne. When you start getting into more inflammatory acne, you see more redness and deeper, more painful lesions. That's when we start thinking or at least considering more systemic treatments. Um, most commonly, we would use um, medications like doxycycline or minocycline, which is your, your tetracycline class of, of antibiotics. And mainly, um, we're not treating an infection again. We're not, we're not necessarily treating the bacteria that is, that is contributing to acne. It's more so these antibiotics, particularly those, those doxies and, and minocycline medications, are used to minimize inflammation. They're very good anti-inflammatory medications. Um, 
and, and of course, moving on to more severe acne, if you start getting a lot of scarring, um, then that's when we start considering, you know, systemic vitamin A medications like your Accutane type medications. Uh, so that's, that's a, a much more potent medication, but it's a very effective medication and it helps minimize uh, the chance of scarring if you treat somebody earlier on in, the, in, the, in their uh, sort of progression of acne, depending on how bad their acne is, if you start early and you treat them and you go through the treatment of, of something like Accutane, you can really do wonders in terms of minimizing any potential for scarring. And I would say that Accutane, it's, it, yes, it's a strong medication and there's a lot of concerns about side effects, but it's probably one of the few medications that can, in all of dermatology, that, that can actually truly cure your acne. Um, there's been studies that show if you have patients that are on Accutane, um, it's, you know, 75% of patients that are on acne completely get rid of their acne and never have acne again. So it's a very, very effective medication, but we reserve it for patients that tend to have a lot more severe acne, just mainly based on the side effects. Are there any new topical antibiotics that are being studied and showing uh, improved efficacy? <clears throat> yeah, there's actually, um, particularly in uh, topical medications, there's a lot of uh, combination medications that have come out in the last several years. And what I mean by combination medications is it's basically two medicines that are, that are sort of formulated or compounded together. Uh, a lot of them are, you know, benzoyl peroxide with a retinoid or a benzoyl peroxide with uh, an antibiotic, like clindamycin is a very common topical antibiotic that I use. And that medication is commonly compounded with either benzoyl peroxide or your topical retinoids. Um, and a lot of them are name brand medications, but that's a, that's a very common thing that's been done in the last several years where um, they're combining two medicines in one, so it minimizes the, the sort of nuisance of having to put on multiple medications on your skin. And that way you're sort of increasing the chance of, of these kids using the medications or being more adherent to their, to their regimen. Um, there's another topical antibiotic that we tend to use more so in females. It's just shown uh, more efficacy in female patients, but it's a, a topical medicine called Axone, A-C-Z-O-N-E. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's basically a topical formulation of Dapsone, which is, a, is an antibiotic, but also has a strong anti-inflammatory properties. And that, that's actually a very, very effective medication if you have patients that aren't feeling like the, the benzoyl peroxide and retinoid combinations are working as well, we tend to try to shift towards uh, the axone because it has a slightly different mechanism of action. Um, but those are the common ones. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't know of any other um, major topical antibiotics or anti-inflammatory medications uh, that are used aside from those. A lot of them are just different formulations of the same thing. A lot of them, are, like I said, are either benzoyl peroxide, clindamycin combinations, or, um, you know, topical retinoid clindamycin combinations. And then, of course, the axone. And then what about spironolactone? Yeah, so spironolactone is a very good medication that's used mainly for um, acne that is related to hormonal input. Um, and what I mean by that is, Usually you'll see it in patients where, you know, you're, when you're interviewing the patient and they talk about um, getting acne flares around or during their menstrual cycle. So mainly it's for female patients. Um, and so part of how spironolactone works is that it's, a, it's, it's an antagonist to um, essentially, it's basically a hormonal antagonist. So a lot of why people get acne is there's, certain types of you know, uh, hormones that are binding to receptors in your skin and creating the inflammation from the inside out. And so how spironolactone works is it blocks that interaction with the receptors in your skin. Um, and so it's a very effective medication for treating hormonally mediated acne. So particularly for patients who are getting acne related to their menstrual cycle. Um, you have to, of course, you know, caution the patients on, on some of the side effects of, those, of spironolactone because there can be very mild sort of menstrual type side effects, uh, such as, you know, breast tenderness and 
um, sort of abnormal periods when they first start the medication as their bodies are getting used to the medication. But it's a very effective uh, medicine for, for that specific um, sort of class of patients that are getting that kind of acne. Okay, thanks for answering those questions. Sure. Um, and then, you know, of course, sunburns, everybody knows what a sunburn is, uh, you know, di different levels of severity. Uh, obviously, what happens when you get a sunburn is you get these, it's essentially just inflammation in the skin. It's ultraviolet light that's causing your skin to become inflamed and get darker. Uh, there's different inflammatory mediators that are released when you get a sunburn, which cause the pain and the redness. Um, and these are just different pictures, of course. You can kind of see um, evidence of where you're covering your skin versus not covering the skin. You can kind of see the very fine, you know, very well demarcations in areas that are covered versus non-covered. And if you look at the bottom left-hand picture, this is just an example of, you know, showing somebody where they have a lot more sun damage on their left cheek versus their right cheek, as they probably maybe had a job where they were doing a lot of driving, so they were getting a lot of sunlight coming in on the left-hand side of their, their face versus their right. So that's more of a long-term change, long-term effects of, you know, sun damage over time. It causes a lot of wrinkles and a lot of, uh, you know, sort of sebaceous uh, oil gland production that causes your skin to look like that. Yeah, so this is just kind of more going over like the physiology of what a sunburn in is. We can kind of skip that. It's not, not that important. And again, um, you guys can kind of review this. We just want to touch real briefly on the right-hand side of that table. So of course, your susceptibility to getting a sunburn and your overall susceptibility to sun damage and skin cancers has to do with your, your genetics in terms of how your skin is. There's a uh, sort of a rating system that we use um, to describe different types of skin. It's called the Fitzpatrick skin type scale. And as you see, obviously going from one to six, one is of course somebody who's really, really fair, tends to have you know, red hair, lighter eyes, and essentially is just extremely sensitive to the sun. They're not able to do any tan. They can't get any tan. Their skin will not get darker. They basically just burn and that's all they can do. Um, and then of course it kind of goes from there. Your, your type four and above would be you know, more like, you know, African American patients or, or just much darker skin patients that rarely burn and they very easily can get darker just based on sun exposure. So the darker that your skin is inherently, um, theoretically, you have more protection against sun damage. And that has to do with, uh, you know, the darker your skin is, you have more melanin pigment in your skin and melanin actually protects the nucleus of your skin cells where the DNA damage could be taking place from, from sun exposure. Anytime you get sun damage, there's um, basically you know, nuclear or, or sort of cellular damage that's taking place in the DNA of your cells. So if you have more pigment in your skin at baseline, that pigment is going to protect the DNA to a certain extent, and you'd be less likely to get skin cancers later on. Uh, if you're really fair skin like myself, of course, then you're going to be more susceptible to sun damage in general, and therefore later on in life, uh, more skin cancers. So, you know, just sort of general recommendations for treating sunburns or dealing with sunburns. There's nothing that's going to take the sunburn away once you've had one. Um, obviously, you just it sort of has to just run its course, but things that can be symptomatically can be helpful cool compresses, uh, topical anesthetics such as menthol or uh, pramoxine, which are found in products like Sarna. Sarna is a lotion that we tend to give for patients who have itching, but it can be helpful for uh, the itching that you get with sunburns. I tend not to recommend topical steroids just because I don't feel like they're that effective in treating the sunburn. Um, you know, a lot of people like to use uh, topical aloe vera gel which can be helpful mainly just in terms of soothing the skin. One recommendation would be to keep it refrigerated or anything that you're going to put on the skin for a sunburn. If you keep it refrigerated, that cold, you know, cooling effect on the skin will help calm the inflammation down to a certain extent and also just kind of help soothe the, the symptoms that you get. Um, I've never used oral steroids for, for treating a sunburn. I don't know of any other dermatologist that has. There's also some sort of loose 
loose inf uh, loose uh, evidence behind using you know your ibuprofen type medications for calming the inflammation down in the skin again it's not something i regularly recommend but it has been noted to be helpful in certain patients um, and this is just sort of a, some other types of uh, conditions that people can have more more on the sort of a, a genetic basis you can have um, you can be born with certain susceptibilities to sun to to the sun uh, these are just a list of different types of uh, conditions where whereby your skin can be more susceptible to the to the sun and then of course certain medications can actually make your skin more susceptible and more sensitive to the sun you can get allergic reactions that take place based on the fact that you may have a certain medication in your system which can make your skin more sensitive so that's more you can get something called a photoallergic reaction which is a true allergy in your skin that the medication is creating and then there's also a phototoxic reaction which is not a true allergy it's just your skin is susceptible to to the sun based on the medication that you're taking uh, one example would be um, you know, doxycycline is, is something that can make your skin more sensitive and you can get phototoxic reactions to, to doxycycline. So if you're having a, going back to the acne patients, especially in the summertime, if you're starting a patient on, on a doxycycline and they're going to be outside, you have to really counsel them on sun protection and being aware of that, that susceptibility. So. Yeah, again, this is just some con, you know, very non-exhaustive list, although it looks exhaustive, but lots of different medications, topical medications and systemic medications that can cause your skin to sort of erupt when exposed to the sun. So the top picture is showing you more of a photoallergic type reaction. Um, and you can see this in, you know, certain types of foods can actually make your skin more susceptible to to getting this kind of reaction, uh, like lime. Lime juice is a very common one. Um, so if you have, you know, if you're cutting up a lime and making drinks with lime and you forget to rinse your hands off and you put your, you know, your hands on your arm or something like that and you go outside, you can get these very specific, um, you know, sort of reactions in the skin. It's a, basically an allergic reaction that's been triggered by sun exposure. And the, in addition to that, that sort of allergen, being on the skin. So the top picture is showing you like, you know, somebody must have brushed their arm with some agent that made their skin more susceptible to the sun. And as soon as they get exposed to the sun, they get this allergic reaction. You can kind of see if you look closely, there's some blistering there, which is a classic presentation of allergic, der allergic contact dermatitis. But in this case, it's photoallergic. Um, so yeah, so lots of different medications can make your skin more, se more sensitive to the sun and also create allergic reactions from, from sun exposure. Uh, just some more examples of you know, different types of what we would call photodermatoses. So these are conditions where kids basically are born with certain types of uh, sensitivities to the sun. Um, a PMLE stands for polymorphous light eruption. And as you can see in the pictures, the reason why it's called polymorphous is because the lesions don't, they're not consistent in terms of how they look. It can show up in several different ways. Uh, very, very common to see them on the, the forearms there, uh, upper arms, and of course the face. Uh, but that's, it's commonly seen when you're starting to see, uh, you know, in the spring and early summer, early months in the summer. And it actually is, uh, it tends to kind of go away as the patient exposes themselves to more sunlight. So it's more of an early stage uh, kind of reaction that you can get uh, to sun exposure. And actinic pyrigo is really, really uncommon. It's a very rare condition, but as you can see, it kind of shows up in areas where you get sun exposure or you can get sun exposure and then you, then you can get sort of rashes that show up even in areas where, that are not exposed to the sun. And of course, perigo just means itching. It's a it's a itching disorder where upon sun exposure you start itching, and then of course the more itching that goes on, the more scratching and more excoriations that you'll see in the skin. And that's kind of an example here in these pictures. Most of these lesions on the arms and the backside are mainly from patients just picking and scratching at their skin. It's not necessarily from the sun itself. The sun is creating the itching, and then of course. Secondarily, you get all these lesions from the, from the patient picking at their skin. 
so moving on to you know more, I guess in my in my sort of opinion, a little bit more interesting stuff. Um, you see a lot of lot of viral rashes in kids. Um, commonly, um, you know, these are just some examples. Hand, foot, and mouth disease is very common. It's basically caused by an echo virus, like Coxsackie would be a common virus that causes hand, foot, and mouth disease. And, you know, sort of, it's kind of uh, self-explanatory. It shows up in the, in the hands, the feet, and in the mouth. You see these very small, uh, you know, sort of blisters on the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. And of course, you get minor ulcerations on the tongue and inside the mouth. Um, and then a, another common reaction is more of a secondary phenomenon that takes place is after the virus is sort of cleared, just based on how the virus affects the body that you're, you know, sort of puts stress on your body. So one of the common secondary things that takes place is it can affect, you know, how your nails are growing out. So you get this uh, sort of splitting in your nails. You see that quite a bit, or we see it quite a bit in kids who have had a recent hand, foot, and mouth infection. Um, but this, you know, hand, foot, and mouth is, is, uh, pretty common and it's, it can be really painful to the kids. Uh, it's nothing specifically that we use to treat it, just mainly supportive care. Um, and then again, on the top, pityriasis rosea, um, you get these sort of oval shaped scaly patches, um, with this, what we call wafer like scale. So if you look at the top left corner, it almost looks like a very thin wafer of, of skin that's sort of sitting on the surface. Um, and this can be sort of kind of confused for ringworm because of the, the shape and the, the sort of ring-like appearance. Um, but the difference between this and ringworm is ringworm generally has, if you look very, very carefully, this is more of a sort of a subtle morphological difference between pityriasis rosea and something like ringworm. In ringworm, if you look at the areas that are scaling, you get what's called a leading edge, um, where the scale is sort of in front of the redness. In pityriasis rosea, it's sort of the scaling is kind of, um, how do I describe it? It's basically kind of behind the redness. It can be both in front of and behind. And so, and, and the scaling tends to be more, um, throughout the entirety of the lesion. Whereas in a ringworm lesion, it's just along the outside of that ring. So that's the major difference. And that's a very subtle thing that, you know, most people wouldn't necessarily be able to see unless, unless you see this sort of stuff all the time, um, you know, which is why, <laughs> why us nerdy dermatologists can kind of pick up these, these uh, subtle changes in the skin and kind of, you know, figure out what's going on. But both of these are very common viral reactions to the skin. Uh, both of which there's not really a specific treatment for. Pityriasis rosea tends to persist, you know, for about six to eight weeks at a time. And as it resolves, it can again leave this, this sort of darkening in the skin, depending on your skin type, which again is that, that sort of pigment change that takes place as a secondary phenomenon. Yeah, so again, pityriasis rosea, there's been sort of reports of using different types of things to treat the, the, the sort of viral azanthum. I've never recommended topical steroids. Uh, phototherapy can actually be really helpful for treating pityriasis rosea. If you have somebody who's, you know, like maybe a teenager and they're going to be going to the prom or something like that coming up in the next few weeks, you can certainly have them come into the office and, and get phototherapy done a couple of times a week for, for a few weeks that can help sort of minimize the appearance of the reaction. Uh, but again, it's not getting rid of anything. And again, hand, foot, and mouth, just supportive care, you know, keeping them comfortable. Uh, again, so more, more skin infection stuff. Again, tinea corporis or ringworm, which is a common thing seen um, in kids, and it's, it is contagious, it, you know, certainly if you have multiple children that are playing around together in close contact, yes, it can spread. Um, or in the case of tinea capitis, which is basically ringworm in, in the scalp or in the hair, which is actually a deeper infection. Tinea, tinea capitis uh, is where the fungal elements, it's a fungal infection where the fungal elements are getting deeper down into the base of the hair. So it's harder to treat with topical medications. So that's the main difference between tinea corporis and tinea capitis. 
again, uh, tinea versicolor. This is more of a yeast, not necessarily a fungus that shows up. Um, and very, very commonly seen in the warmer months. Uh, as we all know, yeast and fungus tends to, to like warm, moist environments. So you, the reason why it's called tinea versicolor is because, as you can see, it sort of changes the color of your skin. There's, there's uh, specific elements within the fungus that upon sun exposure, it can cause changes in the skin in terms of color. Uh, but again, a very subtle, very, um, you know, sort of minimal yeast development on the skin, and that can be treated with topical antifungals as well. Yeah, so systemic antifungals are reserved for things like tinea capitis. Uh, again, it's because the fungal elements are going deeper down into the skin. And so the, they need to be, they, they tend to be treated with systemic medications. Uh, very commonly, we'll use griseofulbin in uh, treating tinea capitis in young kids, just mainly for safety purposes. And they tend to be on that medication. Usually it's about a three month treatment. So it, ha it takes quite a while to get, get rid of the fungus in the, in the scalp and the hair. So uh, warts and molluscum, I'm sure you guys have all seen your fair share of warts. So warts, of course, are caused from a virus that exists in the skin, uh, the HPV virus. And there's several hundred different strains of the HPV virus that take place in the skin and different subtypes cause warts to show up in different areas. Um, but very, very common. It's an it's a infection that only exists in the skin. It doesn't infect your body systemically. And so there's not really a specific systemic treatment for treating these warts. Um, mainly in, in our office, we use, you know, liquid nitrogen to freeze the warts off. There's also a blistering, topical blistering medication that we use called cantharidin. Uh, and there's several other, other different treatments that can be used. Nothing is, is sort of a cure-all. You know, if you look at the list of all the different treatments for, for treating warts, uh, there's a, a ton of them, but none of them are great. So most of the time we end up having to have patients come back uh, if it's like a thicker wart or a more resistant wart, they tend to come back several times over the course of, you know, months. I usually have patients come in once a month to treat the warts and commonly we'll freeze them or use the topical, the topical medication. So you have your, your common wart on the left and then the center picture is more of a, what we would call a flat wart or Veruca plana. And those sometimes can be treated with topical retinoids as well, because again, it causes the skin to peel. You can always also use something like compound W, which is a topical uh, salicylic acid medication that causes the skin to peel. Um, and then the, the far right picture is more of a kind of a warning or a caution to uh, some of our, you know, first line providers. If you ever see a child, especially a young child that has warts in the genital area, you have to consider abuse. Um, that's something that you, you should never see warts in the genital area, uh, the perianal area in a young child like that without the suspicion of abuse. So that's just more of a, more of a cautionary tale. Um, and then molluscum contagiosum is also another virus in the skin. It's, it's actually a pox virus. And again, it exists only in the skin and it tends to show up more commonly in patients who have eczema, partially having to do with that barrier issue. Again, very common treatments for, for uh, molluscum. Most commonly, I will tell parents that it will run its course. Uh, you tend to get sort of flare-ups of different lesions or crops of lesions that'll show up, and then they'll go away and it may happen again. And the, the sort of average amount of time for your immune system to, to sort of get used to the viral components, it can be, you know, sometimes it can last up to two years. Uh, but again, you can use cantharidin. Some people like to sort of curette them and or freeze them. Um, I usually, I'm sort of more conservative and if the patients are okay with it, I tend to just say, hey, it's gonna go away. If you start seeing more redness or more inflamed lesions, that's actually a good sign because it's a sign that your immune system is starting to recognize these, these, uh, you know, these viral components that are causing these lesions. So again, nothing really great for any of these viral uh, sort of warty growths. Um, most commonly it's liquid nitrogen or other topical medications that sort of irritate the skin and cause the skin to sort of peel over time uh, to sort of get, get the skin. Once you're creating inflammation or irritation in the skin, it sort of stimulates your immune system to try to get those immune cells 
to recognize the viral components. But nothing that's very, very, you know, there's nothing that's really, really great. Most of the time we have to do repeat treatments, especially for, for your regular common warts. Thanks. Um, we're about five till, so if we can maybe start to wrap up a little bit and then we'll open it up for questions. Sure. Yeah, so other common infections, impetigo is really common. They tend to show up as like, you know, your gold or honey crusted lesions, particularly on the face. Most commonly, you know, caused from, from staph or strep. And uh, if it's really bad, you can use oral antibiotics, but you can also use Bactroban for treating localized lesions. Um, <clears throat> herpes infections, obviously you can see, mostly show up as grouped, you know, vesicles or small blisters. That picture on the bottom left is, is probably a primary, you know, sort of a, a first time herpes infection. Um, you tend not to see it that severe in, in repeat episodes of herpes. Uh, and herpes is, you know, you can, cold sores are caused from herpes and sun exposure is actually a very common trigger for flare ups of, of cold sores and other herpes like, um, you know, herpes uh, infections or flares. In the center, you see it on the neck. You commonly would see this in, you know, more high school age kids that are wrestling. And in fact, this is sort of an example of, of uh, a herpes infection we call herpes gladiatorum, um, which is very commonly seen in wrestlers. And in the last, the last case, this is a kid that has eczema. And because again, eczema is a, a barrier problem, so much higher risk for getting certain kinds of infections. So this is this is basically a herpes infection superimposed on a kid that has, that has eczema. And that definitely needs to be treated with systemic antivirals. These kids can get really, really sick from, from herpes infections. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so I think, Christine, do you have a quick announcement for us? Yes, hi everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seidel. Nice to see you. Thank you to you for um, doing this presentation for us again. I'll just um, throw a note out. Um, Dr. Steidel uh, did a similar presentation for the Washoe County School District um, nurses a couple of years ago and in our Sun Smart Schools program, um, I pitched it out to some of the other nurses and there was there was pretty unanimous support for offering um, the skin diseases in the school age population. And just for those of you on the phone, I'd like to um, also just give a note to be aware um, the Nevada state law prohibits um, the use of tanning devices in commercial settings by anyone under the age of 18. We've done some research out there and we know that many, if not most of the tanning uh, salons in our state do not um, closely follow the statewide requirements for notice, for warning signs. Um, some in fact even um, offer specials for high school students. So um, as you're seeing those younger patients in particular, but really anyone who's using tanning devices, of course we would urge uh, that they be cautioned to stay away from them as those are a clear trigger for, um, for a risk factor for developing melanoma. Um, also, the Sun Smart Schools program is working all across the state with nearly 70 schools to implement sun safety and skin cancer prevention education. Statewide policy now mandates that every school in the state have policy about sun safety and safe exposure to the Sun in school settings and to allow student use and school opportunity to provide sunscreen at in school settings. So um, anyway, again, and, and one last note, uh, Dr. Steidel and his colleagues at the Skin Cancer and Dermatology Institute here in Reno, they have offices um, across Northern Nevada and into California. That, practice and um, their, those colleagues there have been among the strongest supporters of SunSmart Nevada and SunSmart Schools. And we just a shout out to all of them for all the advocacy work that they're doing around this issue. So thank you to everyone. Thanks, Christine. All right, we had a few questions that come in, came in through the chat and then I wanna uh, wrap up for the day and respect everybody's time. So um, has use of compound W shown increased spread of HPV? 
Uh, not that I'm aware of, not that I've read, uh, I've read any, any sort of reports or publications on that. Um, you know, all I know is that compound W is basically uh, salicylic acid. So the, the main effect is that it's causing the skin to peel. Um, there should not be any systemic effects of that, that medication in terms of causing the spread of HPV itself. Um, HPV exists underneath the surface in the skin. It's not really seen on the surface of the skin. So I would say, you know, just based on, you know, my understanding of, of skin pathology and skin biology, I would say that would be a low risk for spread of HPV with that, with that product. Uh, do you recommend culture confirmation and baseline labs prior to initiating systemic therapy for onychromycosis? Um, I usually, I usually do. So if I suspect somebody has onychomycosis, which is basically a nail infection, um, usually requires systemic treatment because the nail itself, just the, the protein, the keratin that creates the nail is very, very thick. It's very difficult to get topical medications into the nail to treat the fungal infection. So first thing that I would do, yes, I would take a nail clipping and send it for a fungal culture which takes about a month to get the results back. And in the meantime, you can actually get baseline lab testing for those patients. I tend to get uh, you know, what I would call a CMP or a comprehensive metabolic panel, which includes you know, your electrolytes and your liver and kidney function. Um, and as long as the baseline labs are fine and the fungal culture comes back confirming the evidence of a fungal infection, then you can start the medication. Terbinafine is the most commonly used medicine for treating onychomycosis. And again, that's usually used for about three months at a time. Patients are, tend to be treated for about three months. Um, and, and generally when I'm treating the medication, treating the patient with that medicine, I will actually do a repeat set of labs about you know, one month to six weeks in just to make sure that the terbinafine is not affecting you know, their liver function. That's the main uh, concern with that medication is that it can affect your liver in terms of causing inflammation. So you want to make sure that they don't have any underlying problems with their liver function. And of course, once they start the medication, you want to just make sure that you're keeping them safe. Sun is a trigger. Would applying sunblock prevent a herpes flare-up? It can, yeah. Certainly um, very, very important to protect your skin from the sun if you, if you are if you carry herpes or if you've had a cold sore in the past, very, very important to protect your, your skin from the sun. Doesn't mean it's not necessarily gonna happen with sun protection, but it does mean that you're minimizing the chance of sun damage triggering the, the outbreak of the herpes virus. Okay, and then one more question here from Dr. Shane. Um, what can be done to improve dermatologic services for our pediatric patients with Medicaid? Any thoughts there? That's a very good question. Um, I wish, you know, the lot, that's, the, that's the sort of biggest challenge. I would say, um, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I would say, um, you know, as far as what I do, we do have, there's outreach clinics that I go to through UNR, which is, you know, University of Nevada. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of outreach and kind of improving access to care, the biggest sort of possibility would be to have or try to establish residency programs, you know, more extensive residency programs for dermatology training, because that's the biggest provider of medical care for Medicaid patients. I mean, I know when I was in residency, that was probably the largest populations of patients that we saw were Medicaid patients. Um, so that's more of a more of a sort of a higher up systemic solution. On the front lines, I don't I don't know. I mean, as far as my practice. It's not necessarily up to me what, what sort of insurance providers I'm seeing. I mean, I'll see anybody. I can see anybody uh, even without insurance, but it's a tough question and I definitely agree. It's a big challenge and maybe trying to get more dermatologists out there and, and trying to establish more training programs so that we can provide services for these, for these you know, lower income Medicaid patients. Thanks everybody for sending in your questions. I think we'll wrap up there for the day. Uh, Dr. Eckert, our um, pediatric endocrinologist for the Complex Pediatrics Echo Clinic that you're on right now, uh, sent in through the chat box. Our next session on May 8th at noon, uh, we'll have Deborah Robinson from, Wash from the Washoe County uh, response team. She's gonna be speaking about non-accidental trauma and sexual abuse in children. 
Um, so thank you everybody. We hope you'll join us for more of our, of our uh, ECHO clinics. I sent out a link. If you are interested, you can sign up for our listserv so you'll receive uh, weekly reminders about what we have coming up. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Stadel. Thank you, Christine, for, for your help and your partnership with the Nevada Cancer Coalition. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day and a, a good weekend. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right.